All right, well, let, let's begin by reading the text this morning, beginning in uh, verse 14 of Luke <clears throat> chapter 11. I'd like to read through verse 26. We are going to spend the majority of our time on the opening verses, but we will see what these other verses mean as well. So beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> and he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others to test him were demanding of him a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the, the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his house, his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now, I just want to uh, tell you up front as well that I am going to supplement what Luke is telling us here from Matthew, a little bit of the, uh, the, the parallel passages to give us a better understanding of what Jesus is actually telling us in, in these passages. Uh, Luke seems to have sort of condensed it somewhat, and I think um, in order, again, to fully understand it, we need to look at the other Gospels. Now, last Lord's Day evening, uh, our Lord was giving us instruction on prayer. Remember a disciple who uh, apparently had uh, missed the earlier lesson that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount, asked him to teach them about prayer, as John had taught his disciples, and so he did. He told us that we should pray, first of all, that God would be treated in the way that he ought to be treated, that he would be loved and adored by, by all, because that's really what he is worthy of. When Jesus says, hallowed be your name, this is what he meant. He said we should pray, secondly, that by His grace, by the grace of our God, that more and more people would be brought to worship Him, that the Lord would bless the work of evangelism and missions and actually give to us the ability to communicate the gospel with others. And then after having put the kingdom first, He said we should pray that the Lord would provide for us each day the things that we need, that He would forgive our sins and remember in the same way as we have forgiven the sins of others. And I would just, again, remind us that what Jesus is referring to here is not, um, you know, forgiving in order to be forgiven, but he's reminding us that if we have received his mercy and are forgiven, that he has also given us the grace to forgive so that when we forgive others their sins against us, we can know that the Father has also forgiven ours. And then he said we should pray that uh, he would give us the strength we need not to, to fall into temptation. Remember, lead us not into temptation. Uh, not that God ever would lead us in that direction, but he will, of course, allow us to be tested and to be tried because he wants us to grow stronger. So this is a prayer that when the Lord brings testing, which he inevitably does bring to fortify our faith, he would give us the grace to resist the temptation and to grow stronger in our faith. And then, of course, there was the parable Jesus told us to encourage us to pray with persistence, not to give up, to keep on asking, to keep on seeking, to keep on knocking, knowing that as we do this, that, that our Father, who loves us, even as a father loves his children, will give to us everything that 
we need because he has promised that he would do so. Well, having taught his disciples how they should pray for the growth and the progress of God's kingdom, uh, again, the burden of the prayer, I think, has to do with the kingdom of heaven. And remember what our Lord Jesus tells us, that in our lives we are to put that kingdom first. And if we do, he will provide for us all things. Jesus now goes on to give his disciples a demonstration of the power of that kingdom that he has already brought into the world. By the way, not just to his disciples, but also to the Jews who had gathered. He tells them where the power of the kingdom actually comes from. It's obviously not from the devil, but it's from the finger of God. It's from the Holy Spirit. And that is the power that is at work in them to advance the kingdom. And then lastly, he warns them of the danger of rejecting him. He warns the Jews that are listening, that aren't believing. And he's also, of course, relaying this to his disciples who are going to go out and tell other people. And those other, there's many of those people are going to reject. They need to know the consequences of that rejection, and particularly Israel, because this is directed against Israel. So first of all, Jesus gives them another demonstration of the power of the kingdom of heaven by delivering a man who was held captive by the devil. We read in verse 14, and he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. Now again, we see the power of the kingdom here, don't we, in our Lord Jesus Christ. He has authority, he has power, even to command the soldiers of the devil, the soldiers of the kingdom of darkness, and they must obey him. You know, Jesus' authority is absolute. Remember what our Lord Jesus says before he sends his disciples out on the Great Commission? All power and authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore. Now, what that means is not just that Jesus has power over the demons, which he certainly does, but he has authority over all mankind in a way sometimes perhaps we don't often think of. You know, in the, in the, uh, the Proverbs, Solomon tells, tells us this regarding our Lord's uh, basically power or authority over the heart of the king. And we need to realize that his authority over the heart of that particular individual is really the same over the hearts of all men. He says in Proverbs 21 verse 1, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Now, that is not to say that God is in directly in control over everything that everyone is doing. He is in a certain sense, but we do understand that the Lord allows us what we call a freedom of will, right? We have the ability to choose what we want, but here Solomon is telling us that God even uses the free choices of men to work His will. So our Lord Jesus is sovereign. He's, over, he's sovereign over the devils. He's sovereign over the demons. He is sovereign over all mankind, and our Lord Jesus Christ now sits on his throne, ruling and overruling everything in his kingdom, ultimately for the good of his kingdom and for his subjects. The Lord is able to work all things together for good, and how could he do that except he be in control, ultimately, of all things? His authority even extends over the souls of men. He can free from the power of sin. He is the one who really alone can break the chains that hold us and give us the strength to walk in his ways just as he delivered this man from this demon. And by the way, the good news for us this morning is that that is what he has done for us if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. And we also need to understand that that is what the Lord will do for everyone who will trust in him. And that's why, of course, in his love and mercy, he wants us to share that good news of the gospel with others so that he can also free them from the chains that hold them and from the guilt and sin that is ultimately going to weigh them down into hell. Our Lord Jesus extends his mercy. And this was an act of mercy in commanding the demon out of this man and freeing him from this bondage. Now, secondly, our Lord Jesus tells them where the power of this, you know, to do these things, where the power of the kingdom actually comes from and he says it comes from the finger of God. And if we compare that with Matthew's gospel in Matthew 12, verse 28, what he's referring to here, of course, is the Spirit of God. 
Okay, the Spirit of God is the one through whom Jesus did the work that he did while he was in the world. It is the, the one through whom he delivered all these demons possessed from these demons. Now, these Jews who saw this miracle, at least the unbelieving ones, the, the, the opposers of our Lord Jesus, the leaders of Israel, the Pharisees, they did not want to admit that God was behind this miracle. So they accused Jesus of doing this by Beelzebul. Beelzebul is simply a name for the ruler of the demons, which we see here, who is the devil. What they were doing was calling the Holy Spirit an unclean spirit, which is a very serious sin. Now, I've already mentioned to you that Luke does not record this here, but it, it is recorded in Matthew's gospel that what they're doing here is actually called the unpardonable sin, a sin which I think if, if we become aware of it at some time in our lives as we've been reading through the Bible, we've wondered, you know, is this something that, that we have done? Well, let, let's read in Matthew's gospel as to what exactly this is. So this is how Jesus responds to the leaders in, uh, in Matthew's gospel. He says in verses 31 and 32, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Again, this is the unpardonable sin. This is the unforgivable sin. What exactly is the sin? Well, let me tell you, first of all, what it, what it isn't. Because this is, I think, sometimes the, the trap we fall into and certainly the one the devil would like us to believe. Having a wrong thought about the Spirit of God. Have you ever had a wrong thought about the Spirit? Have you ever had a wrong thought about Jesus and the Father? Have you ever had thoughts come into your mind? that you didn't necessarily want there, but sort of popped into your mind, and then you had to deal with them, and you asked yourself the question, did I commit the unpardonable sin because I thought a wrong thing about the Holy Spirit? Or did you in anger say a word against the Spirit? Or did you fall into sin? You know, we read about um, Esau and how he sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge and how afterwards he sought repentance, but he wasn't able to find it, though he sought with it for, with tears. Does that mean that if I profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and somehow I fall deeply enough into sin where I begin to walk away from him and I'm in sin for a while that I've committed the unpardonable sin. Well, you know, the devil would like you to believe that. There are many true believers who have thought at one time or another that they've committed that sin and that the kingdom of heaven has been shut against them forever and they're lost. I'm sure, you know, you've at least run into somebody who's believed that if you haven't thought that of yourself. But the good news is this, that if you are at all concerned that you have ever committed this sin, the fact that you are concerned about it actually proves that you haven't committed it because the sin that Jesus is referring to here is really hardening your heart to the point of no return where the Lord basically gives you over. And really, there is no longer hope for you. We know that that is possible in Scripture. There is an unpardonable sin, right? There is that sin that the author to the Hebrews talks about where people have seen so much of the work of the Lord and heard so much of his truth and seen his miracles and yet they turn against him absolutely, harden their hearts against him and hate him. You know, it says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Now, I think the point is this, that these Jewish leaders knew who Jesus was. And how did they know who he was? Well, they knew in the same way that Nicodemus did, the same way that... You know, when Jesus had, had those messengers from John come to him and they said, are you the expected one? Jesus didn't say, yes, I am. But what he said was, listen to what I'm saying. Look at what I'm doing and go tell John and he will know. You know, John didn't get to see everything that Jesus was doing. He did hear about a few of these things, but now he's got these eyewitnesses coming back to him. They would know in the same way, the same way that Nicodemus would know. In John 3, verse 2, Nicodemus said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. It was quite obvious who Jesus was. It was quite obvious, you know, by whom he was doing these things, right? These Jewish leaders had no excuse for what they said. They knew that he had delivered this man by God's Spirit because nobody could do this except God is with him. 
But that's not how they responded, was it? Knowing these things, they hated him. And the reason why they hated him was because he was threatening their relationship with Rome. Their relationship with Rome gave them a plushy position of authority and privilege and, and some material things that they didn't want to get rid of. And so they did everything in their power to turn the Jews against Jesus. And again, remember what the Jewish mindset was regarding Jesus. He had come as a political Messiah who was going to deliver them from Rome. No, we don't want to be delivered from Rome. They hated Rome, but they loved Rome because Rome gave them all these privileges. So they did everything they, did, they, they could to make sure that the people would not follow Jesus, that they would not believe in him. That is the unpardonable sin. Knowing who Jesus is, having so much light and so much privilege. I mean, these were the religious leaders of Israel. These were the experts in the word of God. Again, knowing who he was, they hated him to such a degree that they would basically say he was doing what he was doing by the, the, the devil rather than the Spirit of God. So that is a very, very serious sin where there is great light and great privilege there is much greater responsibility. And when you sin against that privilege and turn away from it, there is much greater judgment. And we're going to see a reminder of that uh, towards the end here. Now, others, Luke tells us, demanded of Jesus a sign from heaven, but we need to realize that too was an evil request on their part. Remember what Jesus said to the devil when the devil demanded a sign, turn these stones into bread? He says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, when it, you know, I'm not going to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. I'm not going to do what you said. You cannot test God. And then he said to the Jews in a parallel passage to ours, this is what he thinks about those who ask for a sign. Now, he willingly gave signs in certain circumstances. But what about those who ask with the wrong motives? He says in Matthew 12, verses 39 and 40, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. That's what Jesus thought about it. That was evil on their part. And yet, no sign will be given to it but one, the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You want a sign? I'll give you a sign. I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to be buried, and on the third day I'm going to rise again from the dead. But in spite of that, you're still going to reject me. Jesus said. You see, signs are actually given to confirm the faith of those who have faith. They're not given to unbelievers to lift up to ridicule. So an evil generation seeks for a sign. Now, having heard what they said against the Holy Spirit, and let's not forget who the Holy Spirit is, third person of the Godhead, Jesus' companion, Jesus' comforter, Jesus' counselor. He was the one who was with Jesus his whole life, helping him in his ministry, empowering him, guiding him, giving him strength, giving him comfort. Jesus now stands to defend the honor of the Holy Spirit. Now, the first thing he did was he refuted their charge, first by pointing out the obvious. A house divided against itself cannot stand, he says in verse 17. Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan is fighting against himself, he's pulling his own kingdom down around his own ears. Now, it's interesting that they would use that, that argument. It, it, apparently, it hadn't occurred to them maybe to charge Jesus rather with trying to deceive them uh, with the devil, you know, because that's something that Jesus later warns his disciples against when God's judgment is going to come against the Jews for they're actually crucifying the Messiah in 70 AD. Remember that judgment that came on Israel was because of what they did to Jesus. Well, Jesus warns them about that time, and he warns them against false Christ and false prophets who are going to do false signs that are going to try to mislead the elect. You know, these Jews weren't even smart enough to accuse him of that. They were simply accusing Jesus of working with the devil to overthrow his own kingdom, which is really quite dumb isn't it? Now, I think this shows us the irrationality of sin. Sin is not rational. Sin will move those, well, everyone really can even move us to believe or to defend things that are absurd 
rather than accept the obvious. I mean, isn't that the case? The Bible clearly says this, but I still end up choosing to do this. That's absurd. Why would I defend myself in this practice when the Bible clearly tells me not to do it? Well, that's exactly what sin does. It, it moves us to accept things, a, a form of reasoning that is absolutely absurd. A kingdom divided itself will fall. But Jesus had a second argument. If you believe, he said to the Jews, that one can only cast out demons by cooperating with the devil, then how is it that you do it, right? He says in verse 19, by whom do your sons, and what he means, of course, are the sons of Israel, not their particular sons, but how do the sons of Israel do this? How do you guys do it? Now, our Lord tells us in his word that there were Jewish exorcists. Remember in um, what the disciples said to Jesus in Mark chapter 9, verse 38, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And then we also read in Acts 19, verses 13 through 16, about the seven sons of Sceva. Remember the uh, Jewish high priests had seven sons who went around trying to deliver people from their demons, and they, they, they heard about what Paul was doing and how he was doing it in the name of Jesus, and so they thought, hey, let's give that a try. So they found a demon-possessed man. They went into the house. They tried to exercise the demon, and we adjure you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. <laughs> And then the demon said to them, I know who Paul is, I know who Jesus is, but who are you? And he jumped on them and basically tore all their clothes off and they, they fled out of the house naked and wounded, right? But, they, but the point is there were Jewish exorcists and perhaps some of them were successful on other occasions. Now, these Jews would never say that we're doing it by the power of the devil, but they would accuse Jesus of doing this because they hated him. You see, the hypocrisy. And so he says to them, they will be your judges. Not only does their practice refute your argument against me right now, but on the day of judgment, their example is going to be brought up against you and it's going to condemn you. They will be witnesses against you. You know, the very definition of hypocrisy is to commend in one person what you condemn in another. Okay, they're commending their sons and they're condemning Jesus for doing exactly the same thing. It's no wonder that later in his ministry he is going to denounce the Pharisees as hypocrites because they were the ultimate hypocrites. Now having refuted their charge, Jesus went on to tell them how this man actually was delivered. Okay, he does defend the Holy Spirit. I have done this by the finger of God, by the Holy Spirit. Jesus here is telling them the truth Okay? He's trying to explain to them, he's trying to show them the reality that the kingdom has actually come, even though he knew they would reject it. And, you know, we had to think about this for a moment, because the Lord tells us on another occasion that there are certain truths that we are not to offer unbelievers if they are hostile towards it. Remember what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, do not cast your pearl before swine? You know, what did he mean by that? Well, don't give the gospel to somebody who is obviously hostile against it, right? It doesn't mean that you never share the gospel with someone, but you begin to share the gospel with someone and he begins to get angry. There was one occasion where years ago we were doing some street evangelism and I did that with someone and he turned around and started blaspheming Jesus. Wow, okay, well, don't cast your pearl before swine. Don't continue to give him the gospel. I gave him a warning you know, after that. Hey, if you don't repent of this, this is what's going to happen to you. Well, he didn't seem to care. But here is a group of hostile people, and yet our Lord shares the truth with them. What's really going on here? And I think it's because the honor of God was at stake, and especially that of the Holy Spirit. Jesus defended the Holy Spirit. But the fact that he did this by the Holy Spirit, he also points out to them, meant that the kingdom of God has come. In verse 20, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It was now present in the king. Remember what Jesus said when he first appears and he begins his ministry? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom was now present in the king. And this king is stronger than the strong man, isn't he? He's the one who has overcome the devil. Remember how he went out into the wilderness? I've already quoted one of the passages having to do with that. And he overcame the devil in the wilderness. And now having bound the strong man, in a certain sense, he is spoiling his house. 
He is taking out of the kingdom of Satan those who belong to him, and he is bringing them safely into his kingdom. Now, this is something that our Lord continues to do today, isn't it? And he does it through his church, which is why it's so important that we share the gospel, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the only way God delivers is through that simple message. Simple enough, really, for a child to understand, you might say. Uh, thankfully, he didn't make it so complicated. We don't have to make it complicated either. God is the one who will make it powerful to save. We do need to remember that our Lord Jesus is in control of all things. Now, finally, Jesus warns them against rejecting his kingdom. First of all, he reminds them that there's only two camps in verse 23. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. We're either for Jesus or we're against Jesus. We're either working with him to gather his people together through the gospel and through a godly witness, or we're basically working against him to scatter by turning people away from him, you know, by having an ungodly witness and by not sharing the gospel. There's really no middle ground here, okay? We're either for him or against him. Now, we know that if we're for him, you know, the blessings that come from that, the blessings of coming into the kingdom of heaven and having everything that really belongs to Jesus being given to us, that is a tremendous blessing. The privilege of being those who actually are his ambassadors and go out and gather people through the gospel, that is a great blessing. But what happens if we're against him? What happens if we reject him? You know, Jesus was basically telling them through this, this you know, message, you're either for me or against me, that you either have to choose to side with me or you're, or you're going to be against me. Now, what happens if you're against me? And I think that's what the final warning is about in Luke 11, verses 24 through 26. He says, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and not finding any, it says. I return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Now, we could, see, we could conceive of this applying to an individual that's demon-possessed, right? Jesus delivers that person, but they don't side with Jesus. The house is still swept and unoccupied. The Holy Spirit has not come in. So then he's still open game for the enemy. The enemy goes out and he doesn't find another place to, to go, so he comes back and he takes more, and the last state of the man is worse than the first because now he has several demons living inside of him rather than one. But I think when we compare this to Matthew's gospel, what we have here is really a warning against Israel, okay? That if they continue to refuse to receive Jesus as their Messiah, okay, which he has proven himself to be, right, by all the miracles, by all the words, by literally banishing the devil almost exclusively, although not entirely, from their borders. You know that during the time of Jesus' ministry, he healed many, many people. He cast out many, many demons. He, as it were, cleaned Israel's house, didn't he? By, uh, again, through his authority, by working the way that he did. But Jesus is warning here that if they don't receive him, that after his departure, demonic forces are going to rise up against them. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. When Jesus died and rose again from the dead, uh, he sent his disciples out to evangelize, and he did that in order that all the Jews... All the children of Abraham, all to whom the promises were made, would have the opportunity in the Roman Empire to hear the gospel before God brought his judgment, okay? And they did hear it, and they rejected for the most part. There were some that received him. They came into the kingdom, but the ones who rejected him, their last state was worse than the first. Remember what happened in 70 A.D., if you actually read in Scripture, because we do believe in Scripture, there are references to 70 A.D., there's a great amount of demonic activity going on in this judgment because God, when He brings judgment, he, does, he, he uses whatever He will. He used the foreign army to come against Israel. He also allowed the devil to do his work. And again, we read about that demonic activity in the book of Revelation. The last state is going to be worse than the first. Do you know that um, 
Any historian looking back at what happened to the Jews in 70 AD would say, this is the worst thing that has ever happened to any people. And that's exactly what Jesus said would happen in the Olivet Discourse, that nothing like this has ever happened or ever will happen again because they were being judged for their rejection of Jesus. So how, how serious is it to reject him? Very serious, especially if you happen to be Israel with all that privilege, all that light, all that ministry. Remember what Jesus said about um, Tyre and Sidon and about, um, uh, well, the, the, the places where he had done his miracles. It's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah, more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for Capernaum because they had his ministry, they had his teaching, they had his light. So where there's greater privilege, and Israel had the greatest privilege, there's going to be greater responsibility. Jesus here is warning them. You continue down this vein. This is what's going to happen to you. You know, your last state is going to be worse than the first. And again, that is exactly what happened. But again, how do we apply this today? We don't want to miss the warning that is also here for us today. And the warning is the same warning given by the uh, author to the Hebrews. And that is that if we have, you know, read the word of God, if we've heard the gospel, if we've tasted of the ministry of the Holy Spirit convicting us and moving us toward Jesus, but we never actually trust in Him. We never actually believe in Him. Well, our last, the last state is going to be worse for us than the first in the end. Judgment is going to be much more severe. And so if that should be the case with, it, with anyone here, if you haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ, truly received Him, with that, all those evidences that the Bible tells us should be in our heart, that love for God, that love for His kingdom, that desire to share the gospel, that forgiving heart, that reaching out in mercy, in love following Jesus. If you don't see those things in your life, then you need to reach out and take hold of Jesus as He reaches out to you in His mercy this morning. You need to turn from your sins and trust in Him. But if you have received Him, if the Lord has delivered you from the devil's house through the Holy Spirit, and brought you into his kingdom. Let's not forget what this calls us to do. This calls us to worship him, to give him our lives, to serve him with all that's within us, and to serve him in, in this way, to get that message out to others, by, to help them escape, basically, uh, by sharing the message of the gospel that the Lord might deliver them by the power of his Holy Spirit. Well, may the Lord help us. Um, may he help us to do that. Let, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's ask him to give us the grace to realize what a great privilege we have that we've been delivered by Jesus and what a great responsibility uh, that then calls us to.